Next up, Raptor Space Services. Dennis. Good morning. Thank you, welcome, uh, thank you for being here um, in the house of Stanford built. Leland Stanford that endowed this university was one of the richest men in California 150 years ago. He never mined one ounce of gold, he never planted, planted one acre of land. But he sold the shovels to the people that did. And later, with his partners, he built the first transcontinental railroad that became the backbone of America and transformed California in the San Joaquin Valley from a wasteland into America's free capacity. It's an infrastructure. That's what we are. We are an infrastructure play. We have two uh, products that we are marketing today. One is the Raptor 1.0. We are a delivery service for CubeSats from orbit to a more desirable orbit from the International Space Station. The second is the Raptor 2, which is a tow truck to tow geosynchronous communication satellites from the geo belt to their graveyard. The CubeSat market, you've all heard here today about the dramatic growth of the CubeSat market and the economic intelligence, uh, mining, forestry, all the other applications and all the money that has been put in companies like Planet Labs, Daria, uh, and many others. One of the vertical uh, companies called Climate Corp using Landsat images just cashed out at $1.1 billion in this one vertical an application. They're the farmers, they're the gold uh, miners. Uh, science and education, we've also heard uh, NASA does about 30 CubeSats per year, and so that's a market that will grow as well. That, that market is capped by a problem. That problem is frequent and reliable access to work. Uh, the secondary payloads, uh, as you saw before, some of these have been delayed. SpaceX has basically kicked all of the CubeSats off of the secondary payloads, off of their own study for the next several years. And so what we provide by using the Dragon trunk uh, and you are using the HTV unpressurized section is we carry the rapidly one point up to the space station with our payloads to where it's unfurled and all of the mechanical work is done by the robotics on the station. And then we proceed from there on up to our final orbit. This is the market, of course, as we stated before. And for us, we have a potential market of about $80 million a year. We actually expect uh, to be able to take up to 50% of the entire CubeSat market because, again, they want to get to the desirable orbits. Planet Clouds is going up on the Antares with 28 satellites below the space station for an orbit that only lasts six to nine months. We'll be able to improve that for several years. Uh, this is our vehicle, free for delivery to ISS, uh, uses electric propulsion, uh, 50 CubeSat uh, equivalents for Director 1, and we're going to build two of these for the first mission to the station, uh, flying the Q4 or Q15. The next market, and this is the big market, the Geosynchronous Communication Satellite Market is a $290 billion a year market. And the satellites that fly up there uh, generate between 50 to 100 million dollars per year in revenue. And the end of their lives, because of new international conditions regarding orbital and green maneuver, they have to use fuel that would otherwise be used for station keeping to go to a great dark orbit. That's about six months of fuel. So with a 50 million dollar satellite that's 25 million in revenue loss, a 100 million dollar satellite that's 50 million dollars in revenue loss. Our Raptor 2.0 will be able to take up to, uh, uh, we'll go here, this is the market, uh, up to 16 of these per year, per Raptor, uh, not 16 per year, 16 of the lifetime of the Raptor from Geo to the radar world, about one every two months. And so this is the market, we have the most, uh, the latest market intel on this all the way through 2029. So it's a definitely growing market. We can capture $140 million a year of this, saving our customers $700 million in uh, bandwidth costs for being able to stabilize their settlements. This is the system. It's a derivative of the Raptor 1. It uses the same basic bus with a payload provided by the German Space Agency, DLR, their Institute of Mechatronics and Robotics, which we've worked with for several years. They put about 15 million euros into developing the payload already. 
And so we charge $5.8 million for up to $25 million for an MPO, or $7.8 million for an H3500 uh, GO, uh, GO, with about $122 million in revenue per year. So our team, we have Ryan Dobson over here, who's our CFO, very long time solar energy expert in the space field. We have Ned Britt, very long electric propulsion uh, engineer uh, in the field. Uh, we can call ourselves the Silverbacks. <coughs> and we also, we have those partners, we have come to our ground station, our global ground station network. It is servicing the small satellite business with us, German Space Agency, DLR, and NASA. Uh, these are our financials. We're looking for $8 million initial raise. Uh, that allows us to leverage because some of our customers are offshore. The American Import Export Bank is financing most satellites sold outside the United States. These days, they are they're, they're doing almost a billion dollars a year right now. And we have, we work with the people who do that kind of financing. Uh, we also have, so we're looking at costs up to year five, about 194 million in revenue with $133 million in cost with a total net cash after five years of about $39 million. So that's what we need to see that budget. That's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Let's see, for the for the CubeSat market, or the MSL market, are you guys going to have to define some standard interface? And then does this also apply to Geo? Like, do people have to have in mind that they're going to use your service when they put their satellite up originally, or is there a way that you can just attach it to it? It's absolutely standardized. We're using the P5 standard. We're using the existing CubeSat standard. We have on our team the designer of the CubeSat standard. So people come to us just like they go to the P5, or uh, actually Board Get Steady, which is one of the major integrators of CubeSat, is also on our team working with us. So it's a completely standardized interface. If you come from Lower Solovia or anywhere else around the world, you just stick with them because we're here to the CubeSat standard. For the large geo satellites, what we have is uh, the docking payload that comes from DLR. We've gone through several iterations of that. Every single geosynchronous communication satellite out there, with the exception of a couple of the brand new electric propulsion ones, has a standard interface. It's called the R4D uh, engine, which is the Apogee engine. When we actually go into the Apogee engine, we latch into the Apogee engine. And DLR is our, we've already went through all the different preliminary design review with SAP, with SES, with Optus, Singtail communication, we've gone a very long way. All the prototypes have been built for that. The mission scenarios have been done. A lot of work's been done. So just a quick question. So you said in 2014 you've got operational revenues of $6.4 million. What are those revenues? We, we still are a design. Yeah, we are a lot of people provider. Okay, as a lot of people provider in the, the current strategy, the way they do things in the CubeSat market, you pay milestone payments. And we're actually going to give people a break on the milestone payments, but we still get like 10% a quarter, and then it's 15% in the last quarter before flight, and then 25% flight. So we're able to leverage that with about 14 million in revenue before we ever fly. Okay. Um, for the Raptor 2, uh, can you talk a little bit about risks and mitigation? Because I see that there could be risks if it doesn't go to the graveyard, it goes somewhere else, get something else, cause it more debris well, than it was. The uh, insurance ramifications is interesting. When we get the satellite, it has zero insurance value. Zero. Uh, because it's at the end of its life. If you, if you look at the normal yearly, it's the end of life, so there's no economic value there. But we got to it. We go to the wrong orbit, or if we just completely die, we're no different than any other satellite that just dies in orbit. Uh, uh, the U.S. Air Force had DSP-23 that died in geo. Some of the Chinese, Russian, just leave their satellites in geo. They don't even go to the greater orbit. So, in terms of systemic risk, we're going to fall on the same lines as everybody else. But what we're doing is helping to alleviate the global debris problem, which is a new market, and then we can go up there and the Air Force is interested in the SP-23 out there. Intelsat had a Galaxy 15 that failed in orbit and cost them over $50 million in revenue loss because their satellite stayed home even though they lost it. And it took them almost a year to recover it. It cost an awful amount of money and a tremendous amount of goodwill satellite operators, we can be there and then sort of revenue spikes for us to say no satellite. So, so our risk profile is actually pretty 